it's a great pleasure uh, to have a Rick Holt uh, today, who's heading back. Um, so Rick, um, this is a PhD uh, in Montreal, the World Book Prize, uh, finished in uh, 1999. And he came over uh, to Boston to work at the Baltimore Center. He got his uh, very first career, actually. Uh, he stayed here as a postdoc and then a postdoc until 2006. And he came back to Montreal, uh, established his uh, own lab at the University of Montreal as a professor there. Um, so his lab is the uh, Laboratoire de Neuroimagerie uh, Vasculaire, the LINEV. So he's also uh, very su su successful at uh, at learning French there. And, um, and so his uh, main research interest is um, the uh, study of um, cellular sheets of MRI and uh, blood flow and how, um, how these um, impact the uh, ball signal. And, um, and the, the main application is with uh, for instance to study aging or uh, diseases uh, such as uh, Alzheimer's. Um, so, um, and also, uh, sorry to say that this is a, um, this is a, um, so I think that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to, to add, so as you can see that uh, Rick was also my, uh, my uh, Modern in Academia, uh, like uh, doing his PhD in Montreal, was back in Boston and then coming back uh, to Montreal to establish a lab and uh, also he likes farting very much. And so today he's going to talk about um, MRI uh, of a vascular and metabolic function uh, of the human brain. Uh, well, thanks very much, Julien, for the kind introduction and uh, the invitation speaker. It's really a pleasure to, uh, to be back. Uh, I, I've been, so everybody I've spoken with, I, I've said, I cannot believe five, six years have gone by. It's, it's just been a blur. Um, anyway, our kids are bigger now, and uh, I hope I'll be able to make it back uh, more often. I should rather travel now. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a real pleasure, too, to be introduced uh, here by Julien, uh, who's carrying on the tradition of uh, Montreal uh, graduate students coming down here and uh, benefiting from the amazing environment here. Uh, um, so I was also a president on Julien's uh, PhD committee, so it's all very incestuous. Um, <laughs> so uh, maybe that's the wrong word to use. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so today I'm going to talk, as Julien said, about uh, our, uh, the research program uh, we've developed in my group, uh, which focuses on imaging of vascular and metabolic function in the human brain. Um, so the, the main concepts I'm going to cover uh, will be uh, the discussion of the importance of baseline physiology. Uh, I'll go over technical aspects of calibrated MRI. Uh, given that this is a, such a strong methods group, I I'm thrilled that I can uh, bore you with 20 pages of equations. No, there are three pages of three slides of equations. Uh, and I'll talk about some age-related effects. It'll be some first uh, looks at a, uh, uh, at, at a study on uh, the physiological aspects of neurocognitive aging that we've, uh, that we've carried out. Uh, so in general, these uh, themes are important, I think, uh, given uh, the importance of neuroimaging in the study of uh, age-related disease, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, um, uh, so uh, functional MRI, bold functional MRI, uh, is clearly playing a huge role uh, in our understanding of what's happening in the brain uh, when people develop these conditions and when they age. Uh, however, to be able to properly interpret uh, functional uh, neuroimaging data, uh, it's very important to have a, a, a detailed understanding of all the physiological and physical factors that uh, contribute uh, to driving uh, what's usually the bold signal that's observed. So I'll start. Uh, by talking about uh, how baseline physiology affects the bold signal uh, as a lead into these other uh, two topics. Um, okay? So, am I speaking through this mic? Okay, oh, all right. I guess that's for the recording. Um, so, uh, again, uh, baseline physiology, uh, there are a number of uh, parameters which are, are well known to vary uh, with age, for example, uh, as well as uh, with uh, vascular risk factors. Uh, and these are potential confounds in functional imaging studies. Uh, so we know that as you get older, uh, resting cerebral blood flow goes down. There's nothing new there. Uh, resting oxygen metabolism uh, is, a, is a parameter um, that's that de depends on cellular integrity, uh, and it uh, plays an uh, integral role in, uh, in determining bold signals because a bold signal, as we'll see, uh, really reflects nothing other than the oxygen and the hemoglobin going up and down in this deoxygenated hemoglobin is generated uh, through uh, resting uh, or, or 
through oxygen metabolism at rest or during activation. Uh, so we're using the abbreviation HBR uh, to, to indicate the resting, or sorry, uh, deoxygenated hemoglobin. That's the reduced state of hemoglobin or the deoxygenated uh, paramagnetic state. Uh, and finally, uh, vascular function uh, is can be expected to, uh, to 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 generate with age, uh, as well as uh, again uh, in a in a way that's correlated with vascular risk factors like uh, cholesterol, uh, blood pressure, uh, diabetes, uh, any number of conditions uh, that are gonna gonna uh, impair the function of the vascular endothelium. So we'll uh, both talk about the uh, the physical uh, basis of how these uh, impact uh, functional neuroimaging signals. Uh, and present uh, a little bit of data at the end uh, demonstrating how these things change. Uh, again, the, uh, so I don't need to go over this um, here. Uh, it's the canonical uh, bold slide. Um, the bold uh, functional MRI or blood oxygenation level dependent functional MRI uh, is a neuroimaging signal that reflects uh, uh, changes in the amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin uh, that's present in the venous blood vessels uh, in the brain, in, throughout the brain. Uh, during normal function. Uh, this deoxygenated hemoglobin is there uh, because fully oxygenated blood that arrives in the arteries uh, flows through, this is a capillary, uh, and uh, oxygen is molecular oxygen is extracted from the blood, leaving the uh, blood uh, deoxygenated. Uh, and what that means is that the uh, majority of, uh, virtually all oxygen is carried on hemoglobin, uh, sequestered in uh, red blood cells, uh, and these red blood cells uh, exit to more like blue blood cells and uh, dark blood cells, uh, uh, reflecting the fact that uh, the oxygen content of hemoglobin has been reduced, uh, and this entails a number of physical changes, both not only the color changes, uh, a fact that's exploited in optical imaging, uh, but also the, uh, the magnetic uh, characteristic changes. It switches from diamagnetic uh, to paramagnetic, uh, and uh, this, as, as you know, has an impact on transverse relaxation rates, so um, there's no, not too much more to say there. Um, but again, this, uh, except that uh, we, it's a process that's going to depend on rest on the, uh, ox it depends on the amount of the oxygen and hemoglobin that's available at rest uh, to be uh, eliminated during activation. Uh, since during activation, the typical response is an increase in blood flow, uh, increase in oxygen delivery um, that tends to be uh, proportion uh, uh, disproportionately larger than the fractional change in oxygen uh, extraction, um, and it's believed that this uh, serves to uh, to aid in the uh, diffusion of oxygen out of the capillary. This oxygen delivery is largely uh, through passive diffusion, so if you want to deliver more oxygen, uh, then the average uh, O2 concentration uh, in the blood needs to be uh, raised in order to, uh, to accelerate this. Um, so to uh, look at how resting physiology uh, can influence uh, evoked bold responses, this is an example of used in uh, teaching, uh, and it's, it's uh, data that we published uh, in 2011. Uh, we, I use this example of uh, two bold responses uh, that were uh, reported um, for the same stimulus, uh, but under slightly different conditions. Uh, and so, uh, so what we see, so there's a period of uh, several minutes of uh, stimulation here, and we can see in the green trace uh, this is what, um, there's a reason I'm using this sort of uh, fuzzy language here, lots of activation uh, in the green signal. Uh, and then we see in the red trace, there would appear to be very little uh, activation uh, in this uh, trace. And the, this speaks to uh, a phenomenon uh, uh, that, that, that one sees, which is a tendency to use uh, bold signal as being synonymous with activation, uh, when what's really meant is synaptic activity. And so the concepts I'm gonna cover uh, really to emphasize that a uh, bold signal is not always uh, synonymous with synaptic activity or changes in synaptic activity. Um, so there's quite a large disparity between these two uh, responses in the red and green curves, um, the, which is striking if you consider that this is they're, they're, uh, these are responses uh, in primary visual cortex uh, to a very, very potent, very intense visual stimulation. Uh, which uh, you would normally expect to produce this robust, this is, uh, so I'll say that this green curve was recorded under uh, normal background physiological conditions. Uh, the red curve uh, was recorded in the same tissue um, uh, using the same stimulation, uh, but under conditions where we had uh, manipulated uh, the background physiology uh, prior to uh, and during the, uh, during the visual stimulation. So here we've got a recording that shows 
uh, the bold response to a single uh, interval of visual stimulation. Uh, and uh, here we've applied the same uh, intense visual stimulation, uh, but we've had the subjects br uh, breathe carbogen uh, for a couple of minutes prior to and uh, during presentation of the visual stimulus. Uh, carbogen uh, is a gas mixture which uh, contains uh, carbon dioxide uh, and the balance is uh, pure uh, oxygen. Uh, so it um, exerts a kind of a double effect uh, which tends to eliminate the oxygen and hemoglobin in the tissues. It increases blood flow through the carbon dioxide, which is vasodilator, uh, and then the uh, enriched oxygen, so 90, uh, 90 plus percent uh, compared to 21 percent in normal air, uh, serves to uh, further uh, uh, sort of hypersaturate the venous blood. Uh, so in this experiment, uh, what we saw was that uh, the uh, increased saturation, so the uh, signals being driven up to uh, about 7% above, uh, a 7% uh, change against the, the, the baseline level. Uh, there's simply no more uh, the oxygen and the hemoglobin or very little uh, available for any further uh, evoked uh, bold responses uh, here. So this was kind of a, we wanted to come up with an experimental uh, demonstration that one could uh, completely saturate the bold effect and uh, it turns out that the, the amplitude of this, uh, uh, this, this uh, bold signal change that you see during this hypersaturation has a, an important uh, meaning in ter terms of uh, in interpreting neuroimaging signals. Um, it's also striking to note that uh, during this manipulation, so again the blue curve here is the bold response uh, during uh, the, uh, this uh, several minutes of carbogen breathing uh, with uh, visual sim stimulation superimposed. Um, the uh, flow response is, is essentially preserved. We can see a uh, sort of a shoulder of the flow response here uh, that's associated with the carbon dioxide and the carbogen. Uh, and then when the visual stimulation is superimposed on that, we see an evoked uh, visual component uh, that's essentially the same amplitude as what we would see as against a normal uh, physiological background. So uh, showing us that these two different uh, imaging signals, uh, the oxygenation signal, uh, and the, uh, the, the, more the, uh, the ASL signal, which is specific to blood flow, behave in quite different ways uh, depending on the physiological background. Uh, you can see that the, uh, the flow signal is a lot noisier. There's a good reason we use bold. Uh, the signal to noise is much higher uh, than the ASL. But this uh, physiological specificity of the, uh, the ASL signal is, uh, is, is, is largely why it's uh, appealing. So the, uh, this kind of ambiguity that's inherent in the bold signal, um, that it's reflecting oxygenation, and oxygenation is something that, that can, uh, can change profoundly depending on the, 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 the vascular and hemodynamic state of the individual. Uh, that was one of the driving uh, forces in the development uh, here, initially, of uh, calibrated fm fMRI techniques. Uh, so uh, Tim Davis uh, published uh, the first uh, description of this in 1998. Joe Mandeville also uh, published the uh, RAT uh, version of this uh, uh, around the same time. Um, so in calibrated F uh, MRI, uh, many of you know, uh, it involves the calibration of bold signals, uh, typically using a respiratory manipulation. We'll talk more about that. Uh, it's uh, b generally been used to estimate task-induced changes in cerebral O2 consumption. So it's a functional technique. It hasn't been a, uh, a, a technique to that provides information about resting uh, metabolism. Um, some of the challenges are that it's uh, been difficult to validate uh, some of the assumptions uh, uh, in the modeling that, that's done to, to do this calibration. Uh, and um, it's also, uh, it's a technique that's been limited to uh, relative fractional changes uh, without providing any absolute information about resting metabolism. Uh, so some of the, the experimental data that I'll present here uh, speaks to these uh, final two points. Uh, how can we validate this? Uh, and uh, is there more information about resting metabolism uh, in uh, calibrated functional MRI uh, data than, than we might have expected? Um, so to, uh, to, to describe the essence of uh, calibrated uh, functional MRI, uh, I find a, one way to do that is by uh, describing uh, the technique of arterial spin labeling. Um, which is, uh, as I mentioned, it's a, it's, a, it's a physiologically specific and more quantitative uh, method. Uh, so now, again, as most of you probably know, in ASL, uh, we, uh, we want to image blood flow in a set of slices. Uh, in order to do so, <coughs> we uh, manipulate the signal 
uh, prior to imaging uh, in a region that covers the arteries uh, in the neck that uh, supply blood to the brain. Um, we wait a little while, that blood flows up into the slices, uh, and it creates a flow-dependent signal reduction. Um, and uh, so this is, so we've, we've now introduced flow weighting into the signal. Uh, so this alone uh, would be enough to uh, perform this type of an experiment. Uh, so if we just did, uh, if we had an EPI sequence with a uh, labeling prepulse, and uh, we, we ran this uh, in a functional experiment, uh, what we'd see is that when uh, a person uh, carried out a task or was stimulated, uh, we'd see a little bit of a drop in the signal uh, during the task uh, because of an increase in this flow-dependent signal attenuation. Uh, however, this uh, signal alone uh, isn't really enough uh, to quantify blood flow. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very small uh, signal perturbation riding on top of a, uh, a nonspecific uh, baseline EPI signal that depends on a whole bunch of things. Most of them are completely unrelated to blood flow. Uh, so in a sense, um, what uh, so cut a little bit to the punchline, uh, this is kind of like what uh, standard bold imaging is giving you. You can detect changes, you can do statistics on these, you can do inference to uh, decide whether the change is statistically significant, uh, but relating that uh, in a quantitative way to a specific physiological parameter uh, is really not possible with bold. Um, so the appeal with ASL is that there's a... Uh, fairly straightforward uh, way of uh, performing a control acquisition, uh, that allow, which is identical to the labeled acquisition, except that there's absolutely no flow weighting. Uh, and so then you can uh, claim, make the claim that uh, the signal difference uh, between the control without flow weighting and the flow weighted uh, version uh, reflects CBF. So it's really the distance between these two uh, signals uh, that's uh, specific to CBF. You're subtracting out everything else and you're isolating the purely flow-dependent component. Uh, and so now we can see that uh, during a task, uh, this distance gets wider, and we can interpret that uh, as being linearly proportional to the increase in cerebral blood flow. Uh, and so it's relatively easy to alternate between a uh, labeled acquisition uh, and a control acquisition uh, which with no flow weighting. Uh, and you subtract these uh, with sufficient averaging, and you'll get a nice image that's specific to CBF, and, it's, and it can be made quantitative in absolute units. Um, but then what about bold? It's, uh, we know that bold uh, is showing you the oxygen and the hemoglobin go up and down, uh, but that's a lot harder to turn on and off uh, the way you can with ASL. Um, the, uh, uh, there, there are some, some ways one could consider alternating between gradient and spin echo, isolating uh, RT prime, uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, there's no obvious uh, means of doing it as uh, ASL probably wasn't obvious when it was discovered either. In hindsight, it's obvious. Um, but again, so in bold imaging, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, the oxygen and hemoglobin uh, going up and down. This influences the transverse relaxation rate uh, and uh, with uh, suitably sensitized sequences, a long delay between excitation and uh, image de and detection, we get, a, uh, we get an image. Uh, which very much like the, uh, the, the, the ASL uh, flow-weighted image uh, contains a small uh, intensity component that depends on uh, the amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin in the tissues. Uh, if we have an individual uh, perform a task, um, again, we, uh, we benefit from the phenomenon that the uh, flow response tends to uh, increase the mean uh, capillary O2 saturation, uh, venous blood exits uh, being uh, more saturated than at rest, uh, there's less deoxygen in the hemoglobin, uh, less uh, attenuation of the signal, and so the signal goes up. Uh, but this has gotten us basically to where we were with the uh, ASL label-only uh, series. We can do statistics on it, uh, det detect uh, regions uh, with significant changes, uh, but even though these um, changes tend to uh, have a characteristic percent change from the uh, baseline uh, EPI signal, it's not really very physiologically meaningful. Uh, in order to <coughs> specifically um, home in on the, uh, the physiology that's at play, uh, we would need some means of uh, uh, acquiring a signal that reflects uh, the EPI signal, the T2 star weighted EPI signal we'd see uh, with no uh, attenuation from the oxygen and hemoglobin. Uh, and in that case, you'd be able to do a subtraction. Uh, you'd get a difference. Uh, which would be an, uh, a direct index and a specific index of uh, deoxyhemoglobin. Uh, it turns out that in this case, it's not a linear dependence like it is with CBF, but, it's, uh, but it can easily be uh, mapped into a, uh, a linear uh, dependence. Uh, 
So the difficulty is uh, how to get this. Um, so one of the, uh, and, and indeed all the prior uh, calibrated fMRI work, the work done uh, here uh, uh, by Tim Davis, uh, subsequent developments at Oxford, uh, have focused on uh, in evoking uh, small bold signal changes during respiratory manipulations and extrapolating those uh, to this bold signal increase that would be seen uh, if there was a complete elimination of deoxygenating hemoglobin. Uh, so our objective in, uh, so what I'm, uh, we're reproducing here this uh, evoked bold response during uh, carbogen inhalation, uh, and one of the objectives of that was to see if we could, rather than extrapolating, uh, directly measure uh, this bold signal increase uh, during uh, what uh, might be a complete elimination of deoxygen hemoglobin. Uh, for a number, we, th we, th we think we were able to, complete to essentially reduce venous uh, uh, HBR to zero, uh, and uh, this is sort of a, a, an interesting uh, reference point for uh, validation of other um, calibration methods. It turns out that this manipulation with carbogen uh, is, it's kind of a, um, it's not terribly comfortable for subjects. It was 10% carbon dioxide by volume, uh, which is a lot. Uh, and furthermore, the 90% uh, the O2 uh, seems to potentiate uh, both the, the vasodilatory effects of the CO2 uh, as well as the uh, feelings of discomfort, which is probably through Haldane effect, uh, the, um, the, the, the storage of the carrying of CO2 in the blood uh, depends uh, uh, to, a, to, a, to a large extent on the oxygenation of the blood. Uh, and so what essentially what happens is the CO2 becomes more active uh, in many of its physiological effects in the presence of uh, enhanced levels of oxygen. So this manipulation, while it's kind of direct and robust, and we just did this by doing a uh, standard uh, bold measurement is probably not something that's suitable for uh, wide-scale uh, uh, application, particularly in, uh, in vulnerable uh, patient populations, but we think it's a good validation tool uh, for looking at uh, more conventional approaches at uh, calibrated functional MRI. Um, so the, uh, to go back to the, the, the conventional calibrated fMRI model, um, uh, essentially the the, um, all of the published uh, techniques have depended on uh, this, on, on the original idea that was uh, proposed by Dave, Tim Davis here, uh, and that is that uh, bold signal changes uh, essentially could be modeled as a, um, uh, as, as a partial excursion toward this uh, theoretical maximum M, uh, which reflects the signal you get if you eliminate all the deoxyhemoglobin. Um, and you can model this partial, uh, so the deoxyhemoglobin content in tissue is gonna depend on cerebral blood volume, how much venous blood volume is in the tissue, and then what is the concentration in within that blood of deoxygenating hemoglobin. So through a fairly simple model, um, this uh, the partial uh, elimination uh, can, be, uh, can, can be emulated here. Uh, and if we would predict a relation, so under uh, conditions of constant uh, metabolism, where blood flow is increased through uh, vasodilation, uh, for example, by CO2, uh, you'd expect a curve something like this. That is, uh, the uh, bl venous blood becomes progressively more saturated, uh, the signal goes up towards M. In typical imaging experiments, we operate kind of in this regime, uh, you know, the sort of one to two percent. Uh, it's some relatively small fraction of the theoretical maximum M, uh, and it's fairly linear, uh, the region in which we operate. Um, so, uh, so this M parameter, or this maximal uh, uh, possible bold signal change, which, can, which is really analogous to the resting ASL signal, um, it's, it's calling this the maximal bold signal change, is a little bit like calling the resting ASL signal the maximum possible ASL decrease. Um, that's, that's really central in calibrated MRI. So the, uh, the objective uh, in calibrated MRI is to try and estimate this parameter uh, so that uh, subsequent measurements of bold and CBF changes uh, during a task uh, can be translated into a change in metabolism, uh, which is certainly going to be a more specific indicator of changes in synaptic activity uh, than the bold signal alone, particularly under conditions where the vascular hemodynamics uh, are, are, are perturbed in the, uh, the subject. Um, so we can easily uh, rearrange uh, the, mo the equation we saw on the other page, uh, so where M is on the left-hand side. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have measured bold signal change, uh, cerebral blood volume term, which can be uh, modeled based on blood flow 
uh, according to this power law, uh, recent estimates of this power uh, applicable for venous blood volume uh, from Jean Chen, who was recently uh, uh, left uh, Mass General to start a new position in Toronto, uh, would be 0.12. Um, but then, so they're really, uh, the key part of this is um, how do you, uh, during, a, uh, during a reference manipulation like hypercapnia or hyperoxia, uh, how do you determine this uh, fractional change in deoxyhemoglobin, uh, which is central to the calibration of this M parameter? Um, and th this is where the uh, different uh, variants of calibrated MRI have differed. Um, so the uh, two main uh, variants that had, there were the two, really the two main approaches that have been proposed are the original one by Davis, uh, where hypercapnia is used as the uh, reference uh, manipulation. Uh, and there the assumptions are, uh, are fairly simple. Uh, in fact, in all cases, both uh, Davis's hypercapnia and Chiarelli's hyperoxia method, uh, we assume that CMRO2 doesn't change during hypercapnia, um, and uh, that only flow uh, changes. Uh, so in that case, if uh, flow during hypercapnia doubles, uh, then the venous deoxygenated hemoglobin will be, or if, uh, will be reduced by a factor of two. So it's simply the reciprocal of uh, cerebral blood flow. Um, the, uh, so, and this, this works reasonably well. It's been uh, used in, in a number of publications now. Um, uh, limitations of this approach have been that uh, hypercapnia, high degrees of hypercapnia, which uh, produce more easily measurable signal changes, uh, produce some discomfort. Uh, also, the technique uh, depends on measuring uh, CBF changes during hypercapnia, um, so there's, uh, um, which is difficult. ASL is noisy. Uh, for subjects to be comfortable, you want to use a low degree of hypercapnia, which produces small changes, and there are other compounds that make uh, this difficult to do. So partly because of the difficulties in uh, measuring CBF during hypercapnia, uh, um, uh, Chiarelli from Oxford, who's, who's I, I believe is, uh, is or has been uh, in Boston at uh, med school, uh, along with his uh, supervisor, Dan Bolte, uh, developed this hyperoxia-based variant, uh, where instead of uh, perturbing the resting bold signal with hypercapnia, uh, subjects would breathe 100% O2. Uh, and uh, this is a very clever approach because you can, uh, by measuring um, end tidal uh, O2, uh, you can uh, fairly reliably estimate the uh, uh, oxygen content in arterial blood. Uh, and uh, they proposed a, a, a nice uh, model of uh, fractional change in deoxygenated hemoglobin uh, based on measured um, uh, oxygen content uh, as with a sm small correction for CBF. Now the key thing here is uh, that during hy hyperoxia, uh, oxygen is much less vasoactive than CO2. Uh, so while flow changes uh, are a key part of this uh, procedure, um, flow changes can be expected to be essentially zero uh, during hypercapnia. Uh, oxygen is a, a vasoconstrictor, but a fairly weak one. Uh, so uh, the approach taken in this model was to derive this expression under conditions of constant flow uh, and add a small approximate uh, correction uh, for, uh, for the small CBF decreases that, uh, that would typically occur during hyperoxia. Um, so the, um, uh, so we, uh, so I had in, in reviewing this literature, uh, we thought a fair bit about, um, you know, what are the differences between these two? Can one be made to encompass the other? and uh, we realized that with some uh, adjustments to the model, uh, we could in fact derive a form uh, which, was, um, uh, which was exact uh, for arbitrary combinations of uh, changes in flow and oxygenation. So this is what we've called this generalized calibration model, which encompasses both the hypercapnic uh, and hyperoxic approaches. So it's essentially, uh, I mean, it's tedious to go through this equation, but uh, we're uh, modeling uh, fractional changes in deoxyhemoglobin, uh, which we need to calibrate this uh, M signal or resting bold signal um, uh, based on uh, two additive terms. Uh, one is just the flow related dilution as in the Davis model, uh, but adjusted for the, um, for the arterial O2 content uh, and metabolic uh, O2 production. Uh, so it depends on oxygen extraction fraction. Uh, and then the second term uh, which reflects um, the reduction of uh, tissue deoxyhemoglobin uh, that's associated with additional O2 delivered in arterial blood. So if we make uh, arterial O2 go up by giving more oxygen, whether it's in pure O2 or carbogen, 
this term will start to uh, reduce the amount of deoxyhemoglobin in tissues. If we increase flow uh, through uh, administration of carbon dioxide, um, this term will, uh, will lead to decreases in, um, in the uh, tissue deoxygen and hemoglobin. And again, the, 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 this expression is exact uh, and it works for arbitrary combinations of flow and oxygenation. Uh, we were motivated partly to do this by our, hyper, uh, by our carbogen experiments where uh, it was neither pure hypercaffeine or hyperoxia uh, and so subse subsequently we were interested in seeing if we could come up with experiments that would, uh, that would validate this, indicate whether it's, uh, whether it's correct or not. Um, also, we, uh, it seemed like there was a, a possibility of extracting, uh, given that we, there's a dependence on oxygen extraction fraction, uh, some information about uh, resting oxygen metabolism. Uh, so to test this, uh, we, uh, my, when I say we, it's, uh, this is my graduate student, uh, Pauline Gauthier's, uh, one of her PhD projects, um, uh, conducted a series of uh, gas uh, calibrations, and now these were hybrid gas calibrations. Uh, so we would uh, induce both uh, hypercaffeine administering CO2 uh, and, uh, and pure O2 to the subjects. And you can see that looking at the uh, bold and green responses and flow in red, uh, you have a, quite a different um, response profile for these two manipulations. Uh, CO2 will drive bold signal up uh, and it also drives up the uh, flow signal due to the vasodilatory effect. Uh, O2 produces a very weak, uh, there's uh, very weak uh, influence on the CBF signal, uh, which is noisy as usual, uh, but it nonetheless uh, increases O2 uh, substantially uh, due to th simply because we're delivering, there's more O2 uh, dissolved in the plasma and this, uh, this, this, this O2 in the venous blood will bind to hemoglobin, thereby reducing the deoxygen in hemoglobin. Uh, as an additional control, we also had people uh, undergo a carbogen manipulation this was with a weaker, this, this was a carbogen formulation with less uh, CO2, so it was a lot more comfortable for the subjects. It was only 7% and just the 3% reduction made a huge difference in uh, tolerance. Um, and in this case, we can see looking at the, uh, the response uh, profiles, uh, here we've got, uh, so we have a, a flow increase uh, as here. It's a slightly larger flow increase uh, than with CO2 alone. The CO2 contents are the same uh, and this is an example, uh, is a statistically significant difference, which is likely due to the Haldane effect, the fact that the uh, vasodilation of the CO2 is potentiated by the fact that uh, we're also administering 90% uh, O2. And you can see the sort of synergistic effect uh, on the bold uh, response here that uh, we have a much, much larger uh, bold change uh, than with O2 or CO2 uh, administered alone. Um, and uh, so with this, so this is what we were able to do then with this data uh, is we can uh, insert it into a, a, this solvable form of the, this generalized calibration model. Uh, so I, what I've shown here is a huge equation, uh, but just uh, a few things highlighted on the left-hand side is this M parameter that we need to estimate uh, for to, uh, to, to provide, it's the resting bold signal that we need to translate bold uh, to a physiologically specific parameter, uh, the change in deoxyhemoglobin. Uh, and the green uh, values are all of the, uh, the measured values, the observables. So we can measure a CBF during the gas, these are all during the gas manipulation, during a given gas manipulation, so CBF, uh, bold, uh, and the uh, O2 content in arterial blood we get from uh, end tidal uh, respiratory measurements of just the subject's uh, expired gases is sampled and this is a fairly, this is quite a robust and easy measure to do. Um, you can assume a hemoglobin value in healthy subjects, it's quite, uh, quite constant. A hemoglobin concentration value, uh, we have a number of studies where we're measuring this through blood draws in, uh, in elderly or uh, pathology cases. Uh, you probably would want to measure this uh, because it enters into it and that can be easily done through blood draw. Um, so again, you've, so here's, uh, so, and since we have uh, at least two uh, gas manipulations, hypercaphnia, hyperoxia, uh, this, uh, this will provide two uh, versions of this equations uh, which can uh, be solved then for the two unknowns of uh, M, the resting bold signal, and the resting uh, oxygen extraction fraction, uh, which are highlighted here in yellow. So we can solve this, uh, the, any two, sis two uh, pairs of, uh, any two of the equations to, to, to estimate those parameters. Uh, and so the, um, so again, what uh, the previous slide uh, indicate is that we can express M uh, essentially as a function of um, a bunch of measured uh, parameters which are, which are fixed. 
Uh, and then uh, if we don't assume a fixed OEF values in the Chirelli approach, th they would assume uh, a, a resting OEF value of, uh, say, 0.3. Uh, we can allow this to vary. So for each gas, uh, you get a curve, which is this M versus uh, OEF zero curve. So for CO2, uh, it flattens out. Uh, it doesn't really depend much on OEF. Uh, however, the oxygen, uh, the hyperoxia curve depends a lot more strongly on OEF, uh, where they intersect is the solution. Uh, and so as a control for this to see that it, there was in fact a unique solution, uh, we also plotted the uh, carbogen curve. This is combined uh, hypercapnia, hyperoxia, uh, and it was uh, somewhat satisfying to see that it uh, in fact passed through the same uh, solution point, uh, which was uh, uh, located at around 0.35 uh, for OEF and a uh, value of uh, 0.6 to 7% for M which are really quite plausible values of M uh, as well as OEF. And so the, these were done in cortical uh, gray matter uh, for healthy volunteers, uh, but in theory the technique should work uh, in cases where people have uh, impaired oxygen delivery, and that's where you would expect uh, this OEF value, uh, which is quite a uh, pertinent physiological uh, parameter uh, to vary. Um, so, uh, and it's also a small step uh, from this uh, to calculate resting uh, metabolic O2 consumption uh, since we have the uh, arterial O2 content uh, from the uh, uh, respiratory measures. Uh, we have resting cerebral blood flow at an absolute units from the ASL uh, that's, that's conducted in the uh, gas measurements. We can get the resting value from the GLM uh, fits that are done to estimate the evoked responses. We have a DC term which is, represents resting blood flow. Uh, and then the OEF zero is, is derived from the solution uh, so, if, so putting these together, um, we, uh, so for we applied this in a group of uh, seven subjects, seven young healthy volunteers, uh, and we got a fairly good clustering of, um, uh, of M and uh, OEF solution coordinates. Uh, and when the OEF and resting cerebral blood flow and respiratory values were uh, combined to produce CMRO2 estimates uh, in uh, micromolar units, uh, these, uh, in fact, uh, uh, gave, were very well centered uh, at uh, around 140 uh, micromoles per 100 grams per minute, which is uh, in quite close agreement to uh, PET literature. There's extensive uh, PET CMRO2 literature on this. So uh, it's kind of uh, rewarding as a validation um, procedure to be able to put the ideas together. Uh, there are relatively few assumptions made in the model. Uh, and uh, uh, extract CMR2 values, which in fact uh, agree so well uh, with, uh, with PET literature. Uh, moreover, the, the procedure is, uh, the MR-based procedure here is fairly straightforward to do, uh, and uh, PET CMR2, it turns out, is, is quite, uh, quite difficult. It requires three separate uh, uh, O15 uh, labeled exams, uh, can only be conducted at a, a PET scanner that has access to a cyclotron, because the theme is short-lived. Uh, so we think there's a potential for application uh, here. Um, it's um, uh, it's a technique. It's it's um, Chris. yeah yeah. You're going to ask how bad do the pictures look? <laughs> Um, the, uh, so the centroid of these things is slightly under 0.4. It's, uh, I think the group average value we got is uh, 0.35 or 0.37, depending on uh, exactly how you do the averaging. Yeah, so the, um, so certainly the, um, uh, so these are, these are group average parameter maps, uh, of the uh, of of the different estimated parameters M, uh, OEF, uh, the resting cerebral blood flow, and the CMRO two that's derived from them. Um, so OEF is still quite noisy, and this reflects limitations in ASL. It's always the problem uh, getting uh, ASL that's stable enough. Um, it it's there's no it's certainly uh, while it's noisy, uh, gray white matter contrast seems to be absent here. I mean. There, there are all kinds of swaths, sw swaths of noise here. Uh, because of the way this is windowed, it's going from blue to green, uh, which essentially maps onto this 0.3 to 0.4, uh, 0.5 range down here. And the uh, estimates before uh, were for, uh, that was averaged over cortical gray matter. So again, it's one of these things that's kind of at the proof of concept stage. Uh, we think the model is correct because when we do uh, uh, ROI average values, they, they, we recover 
uh, what seem to be very accurate CMRO2 estimates, uh, but certainly these we would like to be able to do better uh, for, for imaging, uh, particularly the, well, the OEF and M values. Um, and we think that there are a number of avenues that we could do to improve that. Um, for example, since the uh, gas manipulations are inherently slow, um, the, uh, we could probably explore other ASL techniques that trade off uh, temporal resolution for robustness during gas uh, manipulations and sensitivity and accuracy and these kinds of things. The, this, this is data we've used for a lot of different uh, uh, model testing. Uh, so it, on the whole, I'm, I'm encouraged that the uh, uh, cortical values uh, correspond as well as they do to uh, PET values, but uh, I would agree that, you know, so we've, what we're currently doing is intensively trying to optimize ASL. Uh, acquisitions uh, to make uh, the individual subject images uh, look um, ideally as good as, say, PET uh, FDG images. Uh, individual PET CMRO2 images actually look quite horrible. They look uh, probably a little bit, uh, they look about like this, maybe a little bit worse, but certainly PET uh, FDG images are very, very nice looking. It'd be nice to get uh, to that point. Uh, and this is a, it, it's, it's also encouraging, that, so you know, Div, um, who's here, and my former uh, student uh, 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 published a very elegant uh, method of uh, imaging cere uh, cerebral oxygen consumption, a quixotic technique, um, the, uh, which is based on quite uh, different uh, methods. So it's nice to see the different approaches uh, emerging that, uh, that nonetheless seem to be able to recover um, consistent uh, values that, uh, uh, that are not, so these are not only consistent with uh, PET uh, published uh, PET values uh, measured directly with uh, O15, uh, but also the stoichi stoichiometry uh, is quite uh, correct, uh, is quite appropriate for what's measured with PET FDG. So it seems uh, we're able to put together a picture of MR signals that, um, uh, that are consistent with uh, what we know about resting metabolism. And, uh, and it also provides the uh, resting uh, bold signal M, which is, uh, uh, can be used to make uh, task-induced uh, bold changes uh, more quantitative and specific. Uh, oh, oh, okay, yeah, Bruce? Um, so what we, so the voxels are fairly large, and what we're doing uh, to address partial volumes is we're using uh, automated uh, segmentation uh, with, um, with uh, I think in this one it was using a civet package, uh, and we're adjusting the criteria to um, only uh, use kind of the regions of gray matter uh, that uh, have a very high prob probability of being surrounded by other gray matter. So we're avoiding uh, areas that it would be close to the gray matter, white matter, CSF interface. It was very true that uh, partial volume uh, uh, issues are, are a huge concern with the uh, large voxels that are typically used for to boost uh, SNR in uh, ASL. Uh, the voxels, so it's uh, they're three by three by seven. So. The um, yeah no I mean that's uh, uh, oh with the I mean the uh, so the other correction that's applied is looking at uh, like um, gray matter fraction versus uh, whole brain volume so we can adjust for that as well I think we're sort of at the point uh, where we're not quite at the point where that's our biggest worry I think the biggest worry is. Uh, is well improving the image uh, stability uh, so that the voxel size can be reduced and the uh, image quality can be Im improved. Uh, so and you know because it's a uh, because the the we have a lot a fair bit of gray matter to work with um, the you know if you l if you inspect the um, uh, the uh, anatomic masks that are overlaid uh, resampled onto the EPI or vice versa. Um, you're able nonetheless to have these sort of islands of gray matter. There is absolutely for sure there's some partial volume bias with the white matter, uh, but uh, I don't think it's a huge effect on, you know, my, my instinct is it's not a huge effect on these, uh, on these, on these values. Uh, yeah. So I'm wondering whether you're using a line to correct the voxels. Yeah, it's a sad, so the, this. So these are, so that's, uh, that's a very good point. Um, so these resting uh, bold maps, uh, they really are the resting bold signal. Like what is the, 
how big of a bold signal can you achieve? And so certainly uh, in areas that tend to have large veins like the sagittal or, or, or the straight sinus here, uh, the resting bold signal truly is very, very large. Um, and so, uh, you know, and it's also true for areas that have a high concentration of large veins around here. So what a map like this would be telling you is that there are a large, lot of large veins here. Uh, and so that the, uh, the bold signal headroom or the resting bold signal is very large. Uh, and uh, responses that, that affect this vasculature are, are going to have a very large amplitude. And so that uh, large amplitudes in, say, regions like this or this uh, or around back here, um, uh, may not reflect uh, correspondingly large uh, increases or changes in synaptic activity. So it's really sort of a, uh, I hesitate to, to use the word normalization, but uh, essentially it's, it's this type of approach has been described as a method of normalizing uh, task-induced bold responses. Uh, and I, okay, well, uh, um, Ken had asked a question. Uh, I'll go back to the hypoacia. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, that's, a, that's an important consideration. And I mean, I suppose, you know, speaking to that uh, and the, um, the partial volume concern, I mean, those are very important concerns. Uh, we're very interested in exploring further, you know, what's happening, uh, what are the, in detail with, uh, during hyperoxia, during mixed hyperoxia and uh, hypercapnia. Uh, but the fact, you know, so we are uh, estimating, you know, there are sort of three uh, parameters that come out of this, which can be validated against uh, independent measures, right? Uh, so you've got CMRO2, which, um, which I mean, really the, uh, with zero fudging or tuning or anything, uh, the gray matter average values are bang on what, uh, what you get in detailed literature uh, surveys of uh, the PET literature. Um, the OEF values, uh, although there's there noise fluctuations here, uh, they're really uh, dead on what people get uh, for whole brain measures looking at jugular uh, and uh, arterial blood. Um, uh, moreover, for the uh, M parameter here, uh, we do have a mechanism for measuring, uh, and in the case of the M, we're measuring it with much higher spatial resolution because it's bold only. Uh, and in fact, the distribution of values when we analyze them the same way uh, is bang on. So it's difficult uh, to assess directly what's the impact of partial volume uh, because of the huge voxels here. Uh, and it's and we really don't know exactly what's happening with CBV from the O2. Uh, but the for me, the good thing about this data set is that um, it uh, provides a lot of testable hypotheses or comparisons against other independent measures, uh, which individually are quite valid. So th we think that these, uh, these direct uh, um, hypersaturation of uh, venous blood uh, it's a very robust and simple technique we can verify with say, susceptibility weighted imaging that we are in fact uh, hypersaturating the venous blood uh, and the values that we get uh, between the two uh, parameters are, are in quite close uh, agreement for that. Basically this is a direct readout of the M parameter and it agrees with what we get uh, in cortical gray matter averages uh, for, the, uh, for the other, the, this uh, generalized calibration model. Uh, this is sort of an example of the overall uh, the study from which this uh, saturation of visually evoked responses was taken. Uh, it shows uh, two sets of traces, one uh, during uh, four uh, progressively increased concentrations of uh, this carbogen titrated against just air, um, so the maximal concentrations here. Uh, the second one uh, is identical except that the, this visual intense, intense visual stimulation was superimposed in the middle. Uh, and we can see that, uh, you know, although it's strong here, it's progressively reduced. Uh, finally, it's sort of at the, you know, maybe there's a hint of it, but it's really at the level of noise here. So I think that this is sort of an independent way of veri verifying kind of that boundary condition that the M measured directly here corresponds uh, with what we get from the uh, uh, applying this generalized uh, calibration model. Um, and again, we're pretty confident that, the, uh, that we've achieved this uh, arterialization in this kind of uh, control study. Uh, we we did susceptibility weighted imaging uh, with various gas mixtures. So uh, a susceptibility weighted image uh, will show you the venous vasculature based on uh, susceptibility uh, difference from deoxyhemoglobin. Uh, so you see the venous uh, anatomy here during normal air breathing. Uh, 
with CO2, it's, it's reduced somewhat, but far from completely. Uh, O2, uh, it's a similar uh, situation with these progressively higher levels of carbon, 7% CO2 or 10. Uh, we arrive at what, uh, and we can extract quantitative values from the, uh, from the SWI. Uh, it's really the, the blood has been directly uh, hyper-oxygenated. So this, I, I think, serves as kind of a validation uh, of the, uh, the concept. Um, uh, but, you know, I certainly wouldn't uh, propose that people do a large-scale study using this uh, thickness of voxels. We needed to get high SNR data uh, to be able to do the modeling, but uh, it's really more proof of concept. Um, the other so the sort of other way that we've compared the results, uh, this is a map of uh, percent bold signal change during uh, uh, this hypersaturation with uh, carbogen um, uh, compared against uh, the standard uh, calibration methods or the Chiarelli hyperoxy method, uh, the Davis uh, model using hypercapnia, uh, and then the uh, generalized uh, calibration model during carbogen. Uh, and so what we found was the... Uh, um, uh, the hyperoxia method alone tended to uh, really miss all of the uh, real hotspots that are going to exist uh, in, in large veins, uh, and it tended on the whole to underestimate what the uh, M value was. The averages were sort of in the uh, 4 to 5 percent range, which we know is too low because it's lower than what we measure uh, with the, um, uh, you know, in some of the hotter areas in the, uh, in the direct carbogen measure. Uh, the hypercapnia uh, was more effective at capturing the big changes in large veins, uh, but it was kind of unstable. We have a lot of artifactual hotspots that are just basically no noise amplification in the uh, nonlinear model. Uh, the HOHC, the, the uh, carbogen inhalation or the generalized model, uh, seemed to produce the best balance between stable gray matter values. Um, there's a problem in this subject here with the, uh, uh, in the occipital area, but uh, capturing the um, the, the, va the large vascular venous responses that we know would be large. Um, so the, uh, so just in the last uh, five minutes, I'll uh, present some of the, uh, some of the actual, this is all kind of proof of concept uh, modeling data uh, on young, healthy volunteers. Uh, we have done some uh, data on, uh, neuro acquired data on neurocognitive aging and uh, in a cohort of um, 32 uh, younger subjects, uh, average age 24 years. Uh, and uh, 57 uh, older subjects with a mean age of 63. They're not elderly, they're not very old, but uh, uh, it's, it's, it's um, uh, that's, that's um, sort of early, uh, anyway, that's the age we used. Uh, the, um, so we explored a number of ch tasks. I got about two hours of sleep last night, so. Uh, so we did a CO2, so here we used the, the Davis uh, calibration model. So it was pure hypercapnia. It was a study that we've been doing for a couple of years. Um, so we used the uh, CO2 challenge. Uh, we did functional imaging with a modified scoop task, uh, and we acquired uh, imaging data with a dual echo supercontinuous ASL sequence. It's the uh, JJ Wang sequence uh, that's also being used here. Uh, and we imaged uh, CO2-mediated vascular reactivity uh, as well as aortic distensibility, which data I will not show. Uh, the Stroop task is, was chosen as it's a, uh, uh, we're interested in interplays between vascular risk factors and uh, cognitive function, and uh, there's a lot of data showing that uh, uh, interference type tasks like the Stroop are maybe particularly sensitive to uh, uh, impaired vascular function or uh, oxygen delivery, possibly because of the inhibitory or executive function component. Uh, so you probably all know, but the Stroop task essentially involves uh, presenting uh, conditions where uh, you have a uh, you have a, a word in a in a written in a blue font, uh, but the this is we did it in French. Uh, but um, the, the actual word that's spelled that conflicts with the color of the, the font and people are required to report on what the font color is and they need to suppress or inhibit uh, the tendency to read the word which is very strong. Uh, in this experiment of the control we used kind of neutral, we used these neutral uh, X's with colors. It's very easy to report on the, uh, uh, on the color of these. I'm not sure in retrospect it was the best choice of task. We could have used congruent uh, word uh, font color pairings in, in that it would facilitate versus um, uh, confound here, uh, but anyway, it's something that's that was uh, developed in collaboration with um, our neuropsychology uh, group, and it's it's been well validated at our center, or, or extensively characterized at least. Uh, so certainly in the behavioral uh, data, um, if you look at the old and young subjects, uh, the reaction times are longer. 
uh, when we refer to this as a switching task because there's some odd to prevent the task from becoming too automatic uh, during the incongruent condition. We have a, a little bit of rule switching uh, within the blocks. Um, but there's a cost uh, if you have the incongruent condition uh, delays reaction times in a uh, predictable way that's uh, considerably larger in the, uh, the older subjects. Um, so again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this data, uh, just to use it as an example of how um, in a typical uh, imaging study we would have a set of bold responses uh, for younger and older uh, subjects, uh, it's and we see the sort of well-known phenomenon. So these are the interference contrast, it's uh, the, the response during the incongruent uh, minus the uh, control tasks that represents the uh, sort of inhibitory uh, component of, of the, the Stroop task in this case. Uh, and we see the, the often observed pattern of apparently more uh, intense uh, and uh, extensive responses in the older subjects. Um, but with bold alone, the question arises, uh, is this uh, due to true increases in uh, synaptic act in the intensity or extent of synaptic activity or is it a vascular uh, effect? So because of the dual echo sequence, we have simultaneous uh, CDF uh, measures, uh, which do appear to mirror the, uh, the, this pattern. Again, these are more, the CDF responses are also uh, more uh, extensive um, uh, and uh, more intense, although these are statistical scores and not, uh, not uh, quantitative percent change values. Um, so this is a type of experiment where uh, once, and we really only finished data acquisition a couple of weeks ago, uh, we, we think that the baseline physiology can be used as a control. Um, so in this cohort, um, again, if we compare young and older for resting cerebral blood flow, we see the anticipated uh, reduction in uh, gray matter uh, cerebral blood flow uh, here. Uh, and these, the CBF values we get, uh, and again, these are also large values, but the CBF values we get uh, do seem to be in agreement and with the ROI masking uh, strategy we're using seem to be in, in quite good agreement uh, in both age groups with the um, uh, with literature value from PET uh, uh, and as well as higher resolution ASL uh, scans that have been done. So this is a little bit, this resting CBF is not really new, but it serves as a bit of a control to see whether we're subject to any gross bias uh, from large voxels. For, I should say that for resting CBF, you don't need to use big voxels. It's easy to do. Uh, it's really more for the task-induced uh, CBF changes, which are quite small. Uh, there, you really are quite uh, SNR starved. It's very difficult, uh, particularly these subtle cognitive effects like the interference contrast are, are difficult to capture with CBF. And that's where, uh, unfortunately, we had to resort to fairly low resolution to, uh, uh, to ensure that we had adequate SNR. Um, what's more interesting and uh, less widely reported uh, are the patterns of cerebrovascular reactivity uh, in the young and old subjects. Um, so cerebrovascular reactivity can be expressed in a number of ways. Uh, in typically, uh, uh, it's, uh, the we it can be expressed as the percent change in cerebral blood flow uh, per millimeter mercury of uh, CO2 change. So uh, it's a nice task in that it's, it's, it's a global response. All arteries throughout the brain are are, are hypercaphnic, so there should be a flow response, and, and there is everywhere. Uh, but it seems to uh, exhibit some uh, reason, uh, regional um, uh, differences. Uh, there are these frontal areas, uh, which seem to show, show higher values, uh, uh, the occipital uh, and parietal areas. Uh, and there's a certainly a, a visible uh, reduction in the older subjects, um, uh, both which is apparent both in the maps and st is statistically significant when uh, assessed over regions of interest. Um, and so this is something that's important uh, as well in functional imaging data uh, since what it shows is that for a given vascular drive uh, that could be a, uh, that may be equivalent to a given uh, synaptic or neuronal input, uh, the older subjects are going to have a smaller flow response. Uh, and so that's something that uh, likely should, needs to be considered when uh, comparing neuroimaging signals between age groups. Um, the uh, M maps uh, show less of a uh, vis visual difference uh, between the two. These have been windowed a little bit differently. Uh, and again, we can see there are hot spots uh, in areas where, uh, where there are um, veins at highly conserved positions, uh, essentially like straight sinus. Uh, these uh, vessels here uh, um, uh, close to the central sulcus are very large veins. Uh, they have a tendency toward very large bold responses. Uh, this is essentially is what that's saying. And the, uh, the M value resting bold signal is uh, reduced uh, significantly uh, in, uh, in the older subjects. Um, 
The, uh, so I'll conclude now. It's, it's been uh, an, an hour uh, with uh, the, 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 these comments. Uh, so uh, again, we wanted to, I wanted to emphasize that bold responses uh, can be distorted by differences in baseline physiology. Um, we've we've uh, evaluated fMRI calibration methods, which in the past have been used to determine uh, task-induced changes in cerebral O2 consumption. But in fact, uh, calibrated uh, MRI data uh, and modeling uh, also can yield information about resting metabolism. Um, and uh, the uh, and so certainly when we look at our uh, aging cohort, uh, there are a number of differences in the physiological baseline uh, that are that are evident. So that's that's what's 